everyone joined at the end and they saw me stumble, you know, but, uh, I was incredibly resilient. It was the books I read, the mindsets that I developed from ages 14, 15. Again, we come back to how did I do this? It was the cumulative effect of all of this work. My overnight success was five, six, seven, ten 10 years in the making. And that was how I dusted myself off from all of these L's that I took. I got straight back to fucking work and I recovered everything. Welcome back to the Virtual Ventures Podcast, episode 26. I'm your host, Andres Sanchez, and today I'm joined by Sammy Loyal. Sammy is a high-level Bitcoin trader creating content on YouTube and has amassed over 100,000 subscribers. He made millions before the age of 18, lives in a Dubai penthouse, and retired his mom by 17. Please make sure to like, comment, subscribe, and help us continue to book guests like Sammy. I hope you guys are excited and enjoy this episode. Hey, Sammy, how we doing, man? Thank you so much for coming on the show. It's a pleasure. What's going on, man? Yeah, chilling, man. Just finished a little morning swim. That was my breakfast. And yeah, man, just getting ready to tackle the day. How are you, man? Dude, I'm great. That's a beautiful breakfast. I wish I could say the same. I know that I need to work harder to keep up with your lifestyle. I've been doing some homework. I've been checking you out. And I think it's safe to say that you live a pretty good life and you've worked really hard to get it. That's what we're here to talk about. How'd you do it? How'd you achieve these goals and successes by age 22? And I'm super excited. I think people are going to get so much value from this episode. The way that I like to do things is roll right in. Who is Sammy? Give us a little bit of background on yourself. And then let's start kind of diving deep into you. Yeah, man. I came from the UK's equivalents of the projects sort of after my parents divorced. It was pretty nasty. Didn't have a great childhood. I was locked in my room. I was the standard kid that was just like playing video games and just an absolute degenerate for my entire life until I was age 15. And that all changed when I started to make money. I was working on it since I was 13 years old, even earlier than that. I wanted to get famous on YouTube because I was a fucking idiot when I was a kid since age eight. But 13, it really started to get serious. And 15 is when the money came. So, you know, everyone's like overnight successes and stuff. I was an overnight success. Yeah. But it took me five years to get there. No seven years to get there because I started at age eight and I only really started to make money at 15. And that was only $2,000 a month. But, (laughs) you know, for a 15 year old, I didn't have to pay rent. That was just spending money, you know, like did a couple of things, been a YouTuber my entire life, basically tech reviews, gaming, news, opinion pieces that changed into crypto videos in 2017. That's when I entered crypto. I probably had a net worth in total of like two, 3000 pounds, basically the same number in dollars doesn't really matter. And then I got into crypto and and everything just got crazy. I wasn't necessarily early. I bought Bitcoin for the first time. I could not afford an entire Bitcoin, but I bought my first, I'm sorry, I bought my first bit of Bitcoin when it was about 2000 US. Um, This is kind of like May, 2017. And great story, actually. I panic sold it at a loss. Um, I I might've bought like 2.5. I panic sold at 1800. I quit. I was like, I'm done. The market crashed. Super famous story of mine. And then I rebought in August of 2017 at $3,000 and felt like an absolute idiot. And that was my first and last <laughs> time that I ever panic sold. But I had a very turbulent trading journey. I, I really was a horrible trader. I was a gambler. I, I was addicted. I was an idiot. And I didn't have enough real life consequences for my fuck ups to actually learn. Because what actually happened is I just blow up my account completely and then put more money in because I'm still making like two, $300 a month from YouTube you know, from the ad revenue and from sponsorship deals and stuff like that. I was making my tech videos and stuff. So I kept on trying. One thing led to another through a combination of running businesses and trading and investing and the other things that, you know, uh, you can do in the crypto space. What else would that be? Like, you know, whether it's advising or getting into seeds, you know, I, I dabbled in ICOs, got fucked many times, a couple of them turned out well, you know, so, so there was a combination of that and yeah, it worked. Uh, you know, it, it took me to, you know, what everyone's basically aiming for. I was certainly aiming for it. I was extremely ambitious, uh, you know, obviously still am, but it's changed now, you know, like before it was about, let's get the money. Then it was about, let's get the travel, let's get the girls, let's get the cars. And to be honest, like it's the standard thing. Everyone says you kind of have to live through it to like get over it. Uh, and that's exactly what happened to me, you know, but I've reached a point now where, you know, I've always been the quiet guy, you know, I had to force myself to walk into clubs and enjoy myself just because I wanted to check off experiences that other people had. 
uh, you know, that, that I thought would be enjoyable. And obviously none of these things were for me. So now that I've kind of come out the other side of it, we're in a bear market now, the markets just aren't popping off the same way they were, you know, in 2021 and 2017, you know, now that we're in this kind of environment, I'm Zen, you know, like I'm, I'm just chilling here. I'm in the Alps right now. No one knows where I am. I haven't posted on Instagram or really Twitter in any meaningful way for months, literally many, many months, which for a guy like me who used to want to flex all the time because I needed that social validation is a big change. It's actually been really nice because I haven't been hanging out with the people that do this either. You got to bear in mind when, when everything's popping off, when you're in Dubai and everyone's becoming a millionaire left, right, and center, and you know, there's a 300K deal going here, there's a 50K deal here, there's a yacht party, there's models, there's fucking a lineup of Ferraris. You're always in it, you know, and it's not a good life. Obviously, it looks super glamorous from the outside and do it. You know, if you want to do it, do it. It's fun, but you don't want to live like that. It's, it's too shallow. Most of, most of everyone will agree with that. But the issue is, you know, you're the average of the five people you hang out with, right? Everyone knows yes. this. So, and I was hanging out with, uh, with people that I now, I love them, but I don't want to be around them. I don't want to know them. I, I don't want to talk to them. If I meet them, I'll shake their hand and I'll ask them with love, how are you? And I'll love them in that way, but they're not going to be having dinner with me. You know what I mean? Like it's, it's not yep. like that anymore. And, you know, so kind of after getting through all of that, I've come back to who I was originally and, and who I was originally was a kid who loved to read, who loved to educate himself, who loved to spend quality time only with an extremely small number of people, a couple new things. Now I love nature. Now I love to hike. I love to go on walks. I love to do the basic stuff. I remember KSI put out a, uh, a tweet or, or something a long time ago. He's like, you know, when you're rich, it's really hard to enjoy the little things like walking a dog. Cause it's like, there's crazy shit going on all the time. And yep. I found that interesting because I actually felt the opposite. I never liked that simple stuff when I was young. When I was young, I wanted all of the crazy stuff. It had to be mine. And then when I got over it, I suddenly started liking things I never liked before. You know, like uh, I would get excited to take the dog out, you know, and then go on a walk and take him up for a hike, you know, because the dog would be happy. I don't know, like it's simple stuff. That's all kind of where I, you know, where I got to now, age 22, lived probably like 10, 20 years of degeneracy inside of three or four years. And, and now I'm ready to settle down and I'm happy with that. You know, life is a unique path. Everybody goes through the standard 18 to 24 in university, maybe get your master's, work up the corporate ladder for 10 to 15 years. And if that's you, then okay. But I think, yeah, I look back to the most interesting people I've ever met. I just wrapped up a three month tour in the United States. It was amazing. I fucking love your country, bro. It is probably my favorite <laughs> country in the world. I met this military guy that uh, kind of turned into a hippie after a deployment. Dude was just, I don't know how much detail I can go into in case I talk about him in the future with his name, but you know, he was doing his thing, just chilling in California, completely alone. No internet connection, bro. This dude had to go down to San Francisco just to connect to Wi-Fi to see wow. what's happening in the world. This guy doesn't know anything about social media, doesn't have any social media accounts, but he goes on hikes, picks up flowers, smells them, enjoys the view, goes home, spends time with his dog. You know, these people that take the unconventional path in life are always more interesting. They're always nicer to hang out with. They're always the people that you meet them and you're like, shit, I want to hang out with that guy more. Hmm. I want to hang out with that girl more often. That's where I found myself is pursuing every single unconventional path. Everyone else is doing the main storyline. I want to see what else there is. Yeah, man. Well, I mean, what an amazing intro. Like, <laughs> I mean, no, you didn't say your age till about the end there. And I have to think that some people are going to be jaw dropped when they they hear that this level of maturity and these expectations from life are, are coming from a 22 year old. And I think that speaks volumes for everything that you've accomplished in this. I mean, let's say short time. I mean, you're only 22 years old, so it's a short time in your life. You still have so much ahead of you and it's absolutely amazing. And you touched on something that's the first question I had written down here. And it's like you started a YouTube at eight years old. You made your first $100,000 at 16 and you made your first million at 17. How? It was really interesting because 15, I made those $2,000. So that was the first time I had kind of had like a consistent stream of like $1,000 or something. And then it 10 x I'm sorry, what am I talking about? I, I probably would have reached something like seven, eight, nine, ten thousand US dollars net worth at age 15. I don't know. Maybe, maybe not. It doesn't really matter. It 10 x the next year and it 10 x the next year after that. How? Well, it's really interesting. 2017, at the peak of the bull market, I reached $80,000. Um, and that was a combination of trading, investing, 
and business. These were the main three. And this one was the biggest one because I wasn't coming at this with a high net worth, right? Like it's not easy, certainly possible. I've done it and I've seen many other people do it, but it's not easy to turn a small amount of money into a big amount of money as a trader. And the reason is because realistic traders are not pulling 300% a day or per week. You know, like a real trader is going to be happy with a 20% profit and closing his account and going home so that he doesn't think about the markets anymore. And the reason that that guy will be the real trader and the others that are aiming for the home runs won't stick around because they can't stick around is because they're going to get burnt. You know, like the only way to stick around in the game is to, you know, make consistent profits. And it actually works out really well, by the way. There's the Kaizen principle in Japan, which is simply 1% improvement every single day will net you a 37 times increase after a year. That's compounded, no breaks, 1% a day, which means if you get 1% better at something every single day, the cumulative effect will be that you're 37 times better. And this applies to money too. You put in $1,000, you leave at 37K at the end of the year. And that's what you aim for as a trader. But when you're broke, you can't do that. It's just not going to work. It, it's a different mindset that you're in. It's a different state of mind. There's no abundance. And you can't really, you know, you have to fake it. That's the main thing. You got to fake that abundance mentality in your head so that, you know, like everyone's like, don't put the pussy on the pedestal. Don't put the dollars on the pedestal either. You know what I mean? Like that, a lot of people do that. A lot of people are like, shit, I'm getting a promotion or, you know, well, if this trade works out, I'm going to make this much money. Like, don't, don't do that. Don't do that. Anton Creel, an amazing British trader, you know, made a very famous video where he puts $20 on the table and he's like, what do you think about $20? Nothing. What do you think about $100? Man, it's a substantial amount of money. What do you think about 5K? Okay, that's a lot of money, right? He's, he's asking this question to the cameraman. He turns around and says, the money doesn't think anything about you. And if you can't have that same level of detachment, you know, you're putting the money on a pedestal. The money is an inanimate object. Chill, bro. When you can do that, when you can have that mindset change, you'll get there. You'll get what you want. But into the specifics, you know, over the years, I just built this uh, resilience to rejection. I built this ability to just ask stupid questions, to just try my luck. You know, like I'm at a hotel, I'm checking in. Hey, you got a free upgrade? Whatever. They say no, doesn't matter. They say yes, I got a free room. What's up? You know, so it's just about like that mentality. I had an Indian dad, obviously Indians are stingy. So, you know, that helped as well. And that mentality took me to a place where somebody asked me to join his trading group. And I'd have to pay 0.1 BTC, which at that time was probably three, four, five hundred dollars $500. And I didn't have that much money, but I wanted to join his group. So this mentality of, well, let me just shoot a shot, fuck it, doesn't matter if it doesn't work out. Uh, that mentality took me to sending him a message where I basically said, bro, I can't afford this, but 50-50 partnership and I'll promote your thing, you do the product. Because I'm a marketer, you know, I've, I've been a YouTuber since I was eight. I've got those skills. Um, and so you asked me like how I did it from age eight to 15, 16, 17. It was the cumulative effect of all of those skills I accumulated because I built a lot of skills up over those years. I learned how to use Photoshop. I learned how to market. I learned how to persuade. I knew how to get clicks. I knew how to do everything. I mean, you know, seven years in the game, you know, and, and that job, by the way, when I was 15 was managing a massive YouTube channel, way bigger than my current YouTube channel. And I was the sole content creator on that channel. I was the only guy, you know, so. It, it was one of those situations where like, it was all just a culmination of everything led me to the next thing. I got into trading and yes, okay, I had to pick up a new skill set. How do I analyze? How do I trade? How do I manage emotions? How do I manage risk? These are all new things, but I combined that with marketing. So I just took this guy's business and my job was to get on Twitter, get on Telegram, get the customers, get paid 50-50. And that was what gave me the money to throw back into the markets to actually make the big cash. And that, that was kind of, you know, like, that's what you want to do. If you can, you want to, you want to put more money into the market rather than less, because the more money you put in, the more profit you're going to get on the other side. Obviously, you just got to be sensible about that. But again, like for me at, at that age, you know, you mentioned I've achieved a bunch of cool stuff at night at, at, at 22. I think that's the goal. You want to move, uh, you want to move fast. You want to move quickly with everything, you know, because you uh, will hopefully get over things. Uh, we'll, we'll get back to this later on, but you know, having that business allowed me to bootstrap, basically, to have capital to throw into ventures. And in this case, those ventures were trading and investing and so on and so forth. You know, and as that went on, I, I continued to make myself into a better trader. You know, so that's kind of like the, the, or the low, you know, like before getting to 100K. Now, how did I actually skyrocket that? It was in the bear market. The bear market was where things got crazy. 2018, 2017, Bitcoin crashed from 20K. Uh, and we actually started coming down to about $6,000. And we flatlined yep. there for basically the entire year of 2018. 
And what's really interesting is in a bull market, you can just kind of close your eyes, lick your finger, touch it to the air, and you're going to make money. And, uh, and, 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 and that's if you're a noob. You know, if you know what you're doing, you know. So it's I mean, a money printer. Yeah, exactly. It's a, it's a money printer. You are cleaning up. You know, you are, you're chilling. Um, so I was the noob in the, uh, in, in the bull market. Uh, and, and I was, tr I was becoming a competent trader. I was getting there. 2018, I had no choice. 2018, I went from a net worth of 80K down to 20. And that's a big loss. I thought my life yep. changed, bro. I thought I wouldn't have to go to university. I thought I could drop out of school. I was getting ready to do all of these things. I always wanted to drop out of school. I eventually did, thankfully. My only regret is I didn't drop out sooner. And, uh, and, and, and so, you know, like it, it was, it was, it was that I was forced to get better. Um, because in 2018, in that bear market, there was no new blood anymore. You know, you couldn't prey on these little fishes that were coming in because they weren't here anymore. They were all eaten up. So the only ones that stuck around were the sharks. And a lot of these sharks were starving off because there were no <laughs> little fish to eat. So you had to eat the bigger or bigger sharks now. Uh, and you either sink or swim, you know, in this analogy. And, and I chose to sink, actually, uh, for, for a very long time. I was dog shit. And I realized that I, I, I was actually lying to myself throughout the entire year of 2017. I wasn't a good trader. I only got lucky. Uh, and I went back to school and I was like, all right, I'm wrapping up. I'm done. Uh, you know, that was my shot. I fucked up. So back to school, I better get good grades to get into Oxford or whatever. And, you know, I kind of did that for a little bit. And I was like, no, I, 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 I can't, I can't do this. I can't, you know, I, I need, I need my freedom. You know, it got to the point I was reading books like Think and Grow Rich by Napoleon Hill, a classic. Great. And, you know, I, I remember distinctly, he's like, you know, you got to have a burning desire. There's no plan B, you know, you, your, your plan A or, or bust. And I kind of reasoned in my dramatic mind at age 16, 17, even 14, 15, that I would rather be homeless on the streets, you know, with a drug addiction and ruining my life that, than a corporate slave, you know, and that's where I was heading, being a corporate slave. So I was like, well, it's either between this homeless situation or a very fucking lavish life with a Ferrari and a nice house in Dubai or two nice houses in Dubai. You know, I was like, all right, you know, like, I'm going to take my chances and whatever. I, I didn't really understand, you know, looking back, that was a little bit too dramatic, a little bit too much, but it worked. You know, I, I, uh, I signed off plan B, no plan B. Uh, I was well aware of the risks and the stupidity of it, maybe not aware enough. Um, and it worked out. And so, you know, I came back in 2018. Now we're in kind of April, 2018, May. And I was like, look, I, I gotta, I gotta do this. I've got to make this work. And I actually, the, the best, probably one of the best decisions I ever made in my life was uh, I picked up the same books I was reading in 2017 about trading. But this time I was like, okay, these guys are talking about how to trade. They're talking about how to manage emotions, how to manage your capital, how to not make stupid mistakes and so on and so forth. Let me just do it the way they said this time. You know, like instead of looking for shortcuts, instead of looking for, you know, like uh, I'm here and I want to jump to here instead of taking the slow, steady path. Let me, let me just pretend that they're watching over my shoulder and you know, they're my father or whatever. It's my teacher. It's my, you know, whatever, some authority figure over me. And I don't want to disappoint them. How would I behave now? So I became clinical. I became a robot. I became everything that a good trader should be. And it worked. Well, it, it, it's as simple as that. I, I did everything I was supposed to. I journaled my trades. I did the boring stuff. I did the hard work. I exercised a lot of constraints. And the result was I went from a net worth of, yeah, 20K in February 2018 to 100 in July. And wow. that was still a combination of the business and trading, but I'm only getting business. This is the thing that's really important. I'm only going to get business if I'm a good trader. This is, you know, they go hand in hand. No one's going to pay me money if I'm shit at trading. So, yep. you know, because my reputation was that. I was the young prodigy that everyone was like, well, who the fuck is this kid? We've never heard of him. And now he's, and it was literally, bro, it was so crazy. I would be making profits of upwards over 100% per trade with nearly 100% success rate. And it lasted like two, three months. And that's why I made so much money through the business too. Because while I'm making these calls on YouTube, I'd be saying something on, let's say, May 25. I'll tell you, I'm entering a trade on May 25. May 28 comes around and you see I've made money. You can't refute that. You know, it's not yeah. like I went back in time and said something different, you know, that I knew would be true in the future. No, I just had good analysis. I had a good head screwed on because I took everything seriously and clinical and it worked. And the result was I got paid for my trades and I got paid from the business and the combination of that ran me up to that 100K mark. And it got so crazy. Can't even remember where I went now. The numbers are kind of hazy. I do have them written down somewhere. 
but actually I might not anymore. I, I would have been smart and deleted those things. And actually what happened was it, it really started to get to my head. Because remember I told you I was like a, a degenerate kid always in my room playing video games. I had no friends. I was obese. I was very fat, no confidence. Couldn't look anyone in the eye. Couldn't even dream of talking to a girl or getting one or anything like that. That, that that's the kid I was. And then I went from that kid to having a lot of attention, having a lot of people admire me, calling me the king, calling me the, the young king and, and, and so on and so forth. I was 16 turning 17 and I got all of this approval and validation and attention and that I craved for so many years when I'd be shunned from friend groups and stuff like that. And on top of that, I thought I was the fucking man. You know, I thought that <laughs> like, if I touch this table, it's turning into gold, you know, it was like that. So the universe humbled me and I fucked up. I, I went from that near 100% success rate with extremely impressive trades to completely fumbling the bag, three liquidations in a row. And a liquidation means total loss of funds. That means everything I put into the trade was gone three times in a row. And that's coming from, you know, like you imagine the kind of confidence I had. I was trading with too much money at that stage. I was like, well, of course it's going to work out. I got, you know, I did all of this. I'm going to be able to do that too. But yeah, I tried and it failed three times in a row. The first time I was like, okay, whatever. Anomaly, I expect it. Second time it happened again. That stings, but you know, let me, let me keep going. And third time I was like, all right, the account's blown up, you know, and then something else happened afterwards, which to this day, I've actually never spoken about publicly, but I won't reveal it today, but it really upset things. And it was a massive setback and it just, a lot of lessons came from it, you know, but I had just turned 17 at this stage. We're in kind of like early mid August. Now my trading performance goes from amazing to horrible. And everybody thinks I'm a scammer because they saw me in June, July, May. And August comes around. And by the way, you got to think like this is at this point, end of July, early August, I've established all of this reputation over these last few months. When is the business coming in? When are the customers coming in that are watching me trade? They're coming at the end of the streak. You know, the guys yeah. at the beginning of the streak were, were small in numbers. Everyone joined at the end and they saw me stumble, you know, but uh, I was incredibly resilient. It was the books I read, the mindsets that I developed from ages 14, 15. Again, we come back to how did I do this? It was the cumulative effect of all of this work. My overnight success was five, six, seven, ten years in the making. And that was how I dusted myself off from all of these L's that I took. I got straight back to fucking work and I recovered everything uh, within a few months. And I was, yeah, that, that's how the million came, you know, the following year. You know, it was just more of the same from there, continuing to rip the markets, made some amazing trades, 6K down to 3K. That was a huge profit. 3K up to 5K when we came out of the bear market, traded that. Uh, traded all the big moves really and, and took myself out of it and you know the reputation came back and everything everyone loves me again and i'm just not making those mistakes again oh you know? I'm, I'm just not you know overindulging you know i learned how to moderate myself i learned how to pace myself and then yeah you know then uh then then you know i moved to dubai everything became even more crazy bitcoin crossed 20k kind of just all happened on it and i continued to trade i haven't really changed my lifestyle much when i turned 18 i introduced all the travel that we were talking about earlier but yeah, that's me. I mean, dude, what a, what an amazing story. And I, and I actually think that we have some relatable pasts in certain ways. So my first businesses were with sneakers. Just I was passionate about shoes. I played sports all my life. I never got a chance to enjoy them. Stopped playing sports in college and was like, you know what? Like these these are really profitable. Let me try and start selling shoes turn that into a six figure business selling Best. 200 shoes a month. And my first big business was on discord and I created a community. It was all centered around sneaker botting. And I identified that these rental, these bots are super expensive, but you can rent them out and being the middleman in this business is super profitable. So I, built up a huge portfolio. I raised some money, $50,000, bought nice. a ton of, bought a ton of software. And then I hired like 40 people who also had a ton of software and I would make a hundred percent profits on my rentals. And then I would take commissions off of their rentals and the business blew up. It went from zero to 3000 user members in the first like two months. It wow. got all the way up to 6,800 members. We were doing anywhere from 200, 250 transactions a week. The business quickly was making seven, eight, nine grand profit a month. And my portfolio of software, because it was dependent on how good the software did, it actually had resale value. Nice. So I'm 22. <laughs> I'm making six, seven, eight K a month in profit. 
I'm also parlaying that into like a coaching business where I'm teaching people how to use the software. And the better I do, the more people sign up for that 500 a month course. And I'm on top of the world. My $50,000 investment in the software is worth 110 grand now. I'm like, holy shit, like I'm never going to work for anybody. Like I'm doing this for the rest of my life. And COVID hit and I start to see some bear signals from the supply chain. And people are like, hey, I think Nike and Adidas are going to start canceling a lot of releases. And I was like, no, like there's no way like this is a money machine. I'm, I'm, I'm riding, I'm riding this out. I think there might be some downtime, but the ship will write itself. And it did not. My $110,000 bot portfolio went from 110 to $20,000 in three weeks. Um, eventually ended selling everything for like 16 grand Uh, that I made a bunch of money off the fees, but the average, our average price of our daily, weekly and monthly rentals was down like 80%. So my fees were turning into next to nothing. Um, nobody was buying the shoes anymore because there wasn't a bunch of stimulus checks. So I was stuck with a ton of shitty inventory and no one's going to buy the course if there's no reason to buy that. There's no like profitable releases. So it all kind of just exploded in three weeks. Like I Uh went from like nine, 10 day vacations, skiing and traveling to like, holy shit. Like I think I might have actually been net negative over the last three years now at this point because I just reinvested everything back in. So I think I, I, I can share like some similar feelings to you of like building things up, like becoming super credible. And then from one week to the next being like, holy shit, did I just lose it all? Yeah. And obviously you had an amazing turnaround. I'm, I'll be honest if mine wasn't, I, I didn't become a millionaire the next year um, because my industry that I put all the time into turned into nothing. Like, do you think the, if you, if you were still in that industry in 22, 23 this year, would it, would it work or it still wouldn't be worth it? Nothing. I still own the company. I still okay. make a couple hundred bucks a month, maybe on it nothing crazy, but it's just over. Like I I missed it. I got in, I got in, in the middle of it, enjoyed the big, massive bull run, enjoyed the prices of the software going really high because all the stores were closing and everything was going to be moved to online. And that was great. Did not see what was on the other side of the door, which was, Hey, these are the last releases that you're going to see for the next eight, nine, 10 months. And I, I I was one of the people that I was like, I, I, I'm not, I'm, I'm pretty good with risk. I'm not very nervous. Like I was one of the people that was like, I, I don't care if this goes down to $5,000, like I'm going to stick it out. Like I'm, I'm not somebody who just panic sells quits. And in reality, that was something where I probably should have not completely exited because there's no, but I definitely should have de-risked what I had going on. Yeah. I was up so much money. But then again, I'm 21, 22 years old, like just learning this, like all in in my bedroom in front of my computer trying to manage this. So, I mean, it's it's cool to have like be able to to put myself in your shoes and understand what it's like to build that community, build that reputation, have those skills out in public. And and I guess my biggest regret, which you did a good job at and I didn't, was I built it all through an alias. Nobody knew it was me. Right. So when it all blew up and when it all ended, I had nothing to show for it. Like now I'm just Andres Sanchez who tells you that I built a few big six figure businesses, but nobody knew it. So I didn't carry, I didn't, I literally lost everything. Like I didn't take anything to the next venture that I had. So other it's, than your ability, you know, um, one, one oh, thing yeah. we, we learned fairly early on as traders is we wish we made our mistakes with 10 times less money. Uh, yeah. and, and, I'm, and I'm sure that you'll feel the same way here where if you had two, three years of experience trading, whether or not you were successful between ages 16 to 19, you would have de-risked when you were 21, you know, when, when you were up all this money and making all that money per month, you would have known better, but you never had a chance and that you can't, I can't blame you for that. When you're feeling like that, like, dude, I didn't de-risk and I had to suffer a major blow where I lost so much of my money because of it. You know, uh, right, right. When I, like, after I turned 17, I mentioned when I had that big downfall, um, you know, and, and it's the same thing. It's like, you know, you need to learn these lessons early, but 
Dude, I mean, I understand what you're saying about all of that stuff in terms of like, you didn't get to build yourself a reputation and so on and so forth, but you're that guy that did it. Whether anyone else knows or not, it doesn't matter. It's too fucking easy these days to make a lot of money without having your name out there anyway. And if you've just got your head in the right place, you understand how money moves, you understand how to incentivize people to buy your shit and how to give them a good product. Like you've done all of the hard work already and it's just, you're almost kind of just bubbling, getting ready for the next one. Yeah. And, and that's this, like, that's why I decided to do this. It's like, I could do some of my favorite things. I mean, I could talk, if people are listening to this podcast, they've heard me say this a billion times. I could talk to a wall, like straight <laughs> up. I love to talk. I love to meet people. And then I wanted to play into what my biggest regret was that I didn't capitalize on building a personal brand with that. So it's like, all right, do a podcast, force yourself to get in front of the yeah. camera and get out there. And that's why I'm here. But I mean, enough on me. You told us this amazing story. You, sh you showed us how you got to this level. Now let's talk about the fun stuff. You have a crazy car collection. <laughs> I see it. You bought which I, what I think is your first Ferrari at 19. That's right. What was that experience like? I mean, that is a dream gold, like dream yeah. car. And, and I, I also want to know what it was like in the dealership too. Like you're 19, coming in there, cashing out on a car. Give us the yeah. good stuff. You know, it was in Dubai. So, you know, what, what people say about Dubai is obviously there's just a lot of money. You're never the richest guy in the room, Monaco and so on. It's always the same in these cities, LA, New York, Miami. You're never the fucking richest guy. You're, you're never really going to impress anybody. And that's how it was in Dubai. I didn't actually go directly. I did go directly to a Ferrari dealership. And most experiences I've had in luxury car, I'm not talking about Mercedes or even AMG, but like proper luxury, Ferrari, Aston Martin, Bentley, Rolls Royce, Porsche even. If you go to these kind of showrooms, it's a young guy and dude, look at the way I dress. Okay. Like it's kind of decent, but you know, like sometimes I'm just in a hoodie. Like I'm a really chill, normal guy. I didn't get good service. I'm a young guy. Who the fuck is this kid? Does he even have money? Probably hasn't gotten a haircut in three weeks. You know, like he's not going to buy a Ferrari. Yeah, I fucking did. But I, I had to go to a third party dealership because I'm not giving my money to some cunts that are just going to be disrespectful. There's no way. Uh, it's the reason that I'll never wear a Rolex because I went into a Rolex store in Oxford street in London. And they didn't even open the door for me until I pointed to them my Omega. And I was like, look, I've got money. I want to look at your watches. And as I walked in after that, like the next five seconds, I sobered up. I'm like, what the fuck did you just do, Sammy? You had to prove to someone you had money to go and spend more money? Thankfully, I, I had that realization. I don't know how other people don't have those kind of realizations. And this you know, sings massively to the, to the tune of, you know, being in the life of like partying and clubs and clout and all that bullshit. It's quite pathetic. And I just kind of knew that intuitively. So I'm grateful for that. But uh, yeah, dealership, it was pretty easy. It was pretty nice and comfortable. Just thinking how much I can say here. Um, yeah, it, it, you know, bought the car. The, the only thing I remember actually, surprisingly, is because it was so complicated the way I bought the car. I wasn't actually allowed to buy a car at that stage. I wasn't like, I had just moved to Dubai. It was too early. I didn't have the right documentation. So somebody else bought it for me and I just gave him the money. So the first person that drove it wasn't me. And, but I do remember when I got inside the car, the first thing was I couldn't get it to move. Like I took <laughs> my foot off the brake, but the car didn't move forward. And I was like, oh, maybe I have to push the gas. And that's not normal on every car. And I don't know, I don't know why, like everyone's like, how was it? Maybe you had a crazy drive. Like, no, nah, I was just surprised that rich people know this. And I did that Ferraris don't move on their own, that they don't creep forward unless you push the gas. And. I don't know. That was interesting to me. It was almost synonymous with the rest of my life on this journey, where as I've continued to gain more wealth and meet more people from higher and higher places in life in terms of social class and so on, not necessarily in terms of you know, other things that might be more important. I started to see things where I was like, okay, there's this whole world above me that I didn't even know existed with, with all of this information. And for me, that was, you know, I look back at it and I smile. I'm like, okay, that, that was really one of the first, it wasn't one of the first, but it was one of the big ways where I saw that there is a lot of shit that I just didn't even know exists. And, and one of them was the way you move a fucking Ferrari. So that was super <laughs> cool. Yeah, a beautiful car. I've sent that car to London by plane, toured it in Europe. I actually took it here in the Alps, which was one of the best experiences of my life. A lot of people buy nice cars and then park them in some, you know, little residential road in London and then just flex it when they go shopping and go back home and like, bro, Give me your car. Let me service it for you. I'll, I'll take it out for you. You know what I mean? Like I, that's, that's yeah. who I am. I'm buying a nice car. I'm gonna, I'm gonna, I'm gonna have fun with it. You know, I'm gonna throw it around. I'm gonna do what it was designed to do. I'm gonna push it right up to its limits. I'm gonna push it up to my limits. Uh, and that's exactly what I done. That car is 
one of my favorite things in life, money does buy happiness because it buys Ferraris and Porsches. And I stand by that statement proudly. Yeah, uh, I, I love my cars. They're my favorite thing in my life other than my family. Uh, absolutely very, very happy with it. Yeah, I, I love that quote. Like I say, and like, I mean, it resonates here in Miami with me. People say money doesn't buy happiness, but I've never seen someone mad on a jet ski. Yeah. And exactly. that, I tried I, I tried to make that my senior quote. They yeah. they they cut they cut off senior <laughs> quotes in high school. But I, I was like, I think that's a perfect example. Like, when yeah. have you ever seen somebody not smiling going fifty miles an hour on a jet ski? I mean, look, it, it, had, it's obvious. Yeah. Like, you know, it's it's not gonna be the only thing that's important in your life. Obviously, money is gonna solve problems, it's gonna make a lot of things better and, and so on and so forth, but you know, we're using it mainly first and foremost to fix the root issues in life. Like an absence of money is where life is bad. And that's where I, that's where I was born. That was my starting point. That was my spawn point, you know, come from that, you know, that, that was the main thing money brought was security, stability, abundance in a sense, you know, like I can eat whatever I want, I can go wherever I want, so on and so forth, you know, so that's really, really nice. And that's, that's great, you know, and then beyond that, uh, you know, a lot of people say like, uh, you know, money will not change you. It will just amplify what is already there. And that's fully true as well. So, you know, like you're going to have your cars, you're going to enjoy yourselves. And these are like temporary, you know, like the 50 miles per hour on a jet ski, this is a temporary burst of enjoyment. And it's super fun, but obviously it is temporary. You know, if you're a shitty person, unhappy, whatever, before the money, then, you know, that will just be amplified. You'll just have more money to like exert <laughs> that on the world, if that is the case. But ultimately, you know, like if you've got all of that stuff figured out, more toys is a good thing, you know, as far as I see. Yeah. I mean, like, why would you not want a manual Porsche and a PDK Porsche just to kind of switch up the experience. If you can afford it and if everything else is fine in your life and your parents are chilling and whatever, then you've done your bits, charity, whatever, like anything that you feel socially, morally obligated to do, then buy the fucking Porsche, bro. You know, like that's, that's my perspective. Yeah, no, I, I couldn't agree with you more. And, and a GT3 is, is my dream car. So hopefully that is something that I will be able to achieve. Last question on the cars. Why Miami blue? Now you know I'm from Miami, so that resonates with yeah. me, which is pretty cool. But what what made you go Miami blue for your whole fleet of cars? They're all Miami blue, other than the first few. Yeah, because in 2019, I fell in love. 2018, I fell in love with the Porsche 718. And that was like the first, second year of that car actually being released when Porsche refreshed it. And when they refresh cars, they release new colors a lot of the time. So... With that one, it was lava, orange, and Miami blue. And, and Miami blue is what I chose, and it just looked beautiful. This, this was also one of the dealerships I went into in London, West London. There's only one Porsche dealership in West London. I'm calling them out right now. The dude told me to forget about it. But when he realized I'm 17, I wanted a Porsche, so I had to go and buy one a few months later. Yeah, it was Miami blue. It was everything I dreamed of. And, you know, I, I kind of just started to turn the other cars blue, you know, the Teslas and stuff like that. And I was like, okay, this, this kind of looks good. Did it on the Ferrari. Then I did it on the next Porsche. That was a GT3. By the way, GT3 dream car, that is the only dream car to have, in my opinion. Uh, it, it is nice. the best driving experience money can buy. All right, get me fired up. Mic drop. Yeah, no, it is. You could <laughs> rent it if you want, if you feel that would be responsible just to try it out. It is the best car ever made. And they were all Miami blue because the first one was, and they look fucking good together, bro. Driving them in a convoy with the cameras, got a lot of footage of stuff like that on the socials. It just looks cool. And I love it. Uh, I actually, I want to see a whole fleet of, of Miami blue supercars, whether they're mine or not in the world, because it's just something that looks super cool. Yeah, no, I mean, I, I love that. And I think it's so cool. Like I and saw I also, it. I, sorry, I also want to throw in one more thing, which, which is, um, really important i think coming from a place like london is a lot of the time the whole world is very boring it's very but not not like boring in a way where like people choose to be boring they choose to be they choose to kill themselves off uh, you know like ev everyone's like you know most people die at 25 they get buried at 70 you know like it's that everyone's trying to fit in everyone's trying to you know kind of you know you know what i'm saying yeah the miami blue car is analogous to this where I'll be driving on a road with all black, silver, white, dark gray cars just on the road. And then there is one Miami blue car just adding a splash of color. We need more color, bro. We need more excitement. We need more desire to do cool shit and stand out. Whether you stand out because of the cool shit or not doesn't matter. But we need more of that. And, uh, and I really like leading that charge in a, in a sense you know like it's amazing seeing people like see my lifestyle and they're like fuck i want to do something more fun you know like whether it's destructive yep. or not doesn't really matter just fucking live a little bit more you know like a lot of people are just so clocked into like 
their routine and their life. And it's like, okay, well, I mean, if you like it, then good. But most people don't. Most people would rather be something else. And anything to be different is, you know, it really, really goes a long way. But yeah, dude, sorry yeah. for cutting on that. No, no, dude. Thank you for sharing that. And I, I totally agree. Like, I love that you're just playing into your personality. Like, you're just doing what you want. <laughs> like, you wanted to be more fun, colorful, enjoy the less boring things in life, and you're doing it. And I think that's great. Like, just talking with you, for, for somebody your age, 22 years old, you have such a great head between your shoulders. Your mentality, your mindset is so much more mature. And now with this venture, I've done over the last three months, I've done, I think this is my 26th or 27th interview. Everybody I've interviewed is very, very, very respectable in, in their own ways. And I mean, something that I love about this is that I continue to meet people who impress me like you, like the amount of knowledge and the amount of maturity that you've been able to attain by 22 is amazing. And anybody listening to this is thinking the same thing. I know it. It's, it, it's just, it's obvious. Like the decisions you made, the way you went about it, the way that you handled problems, the way that you handled failures and continue to get back up, the way that you turned your life in a full 360 is all due to what you have between your two shoulders. And that is a very mature, very driven mind. And all of your successes are a tribute to that. Anybody that goes and looks at you online knows that you've worked really hard and that you've created these amazing successes for yourself. And now you're just enjoying it. Like you're, how can you be upset at somebody genuinely just enjoying all of their hard work? And when I see you and when I see your socials, that's the first thing I think about. And maybe I'm just biased and like I live in Miami, so it's not like crazy unnormal for me to see somebody like you young living an amazing life. Maybe somebody from Kentucky or like Delaware might be like, damn, like what I've never seen a Ferrari before. But it, it's it's just amazing, dude. And and I'm I'm so happy that we were able to have this conversation and talk about this because that's a, that's one of the reasons why I did this. Like now I'm more excited to get after it. Like right when we get off this interview, I got to go work 10 times harder. Because I got to go get that GT3. Like yes, you, do. you mentioned the colorways, like the lava colorway is that's the GT3 that I want. Like nice. that GT3, that lava cool colorway, like that's that's what I want. So like, thank you for that. I have just one more question for you here um, before we get to the last and final question on every single one of my podcasts. But I thought I had to mention it. You met Andrew Tate and you got to hang out with Andrew Tate. It looks like what was that experience? How did you two get connected? Dude, I've known Andrew Tate since, I think, 2018, if I'm not mistaken. I DM'd him on Twitter. You know, with cool people, you want to reach out to them before they get too famous. He wouldn't see my message if I messaged him now. I hit him up on Twitter. I was like, yo, I'm a young guy making money. What's up? You know, we just kind of clicked over that. He just likes people that are ambitious. Fucking cool guy. I love him to bits. Yeah, he's, he's been a friend for many years. Um, he has advised me on, on how to deal with... He actually, he, he's the one that pressured me into buying my first Porsche. I was like, I kind of can't afford it. I don't know if I should do it. I'll never forget his text, all caps. Do it. That's it. An order. Straight from top G. An order. <laughs> I have a Porsche. So of course I had to go ahead and do it. And you know, so, so that's been cool. You know, to have a guy like that in your life, I was incredibly privileged to, to have him around. He has been... Yeah, so, such a cool guy. And, you know, one of the things that, like, you know, kind of being in my position, having hung out with him, I've had him at my villa, hosted parties with him and stuff like that. Well, just one party, actually, at my villa. He was there with Cooper, uh, you know, Cooper Sterling. Justin, no, Dylan. Dude, Cooper Sterling's so funny. Just this whole crew all, all kind of showed up with super, super fun. Dude, it's just, you know, you're the average of the five people you hang out with. And I want to hang out with Top G, you know. So, uh, so yeah, that was, that was cool. It's, it's everything you'd expect, obviously. But he's super, super, super calm and normal in real life. He actually doesn't talk much unless he's spoken directly to, which which people who've met him in person will will tell you quite regularly. And and you know, obviously that's generally just the hallmark of intelligence. So so yeah, I I look up to the guy, he changed my life. And and you know, it, when when someone's like that, you know, you would if I got a call from him right now and he asked me for anything, bro, I'm pulling every string I've got. And then I'm fucking making more strings to pull them to, you know, just to make it happen cuz yeah, you know, you that's the kind of person that you want to be able to help because you know that they'd have your back too. Dude. Awesome. Like just awesome. <laughs> Such a cool experience. 
so many people, I know the audience we have, and, and a lot of people are going to resonate with this story. They're going to absolutely love that you're friends with Top G. Like, that's super cool. And I mean, you're super inspiring, dude. Continue to crush it. Like, thank you so much. The question that I ask everybody that comes on this show is super simple. So I'm really excited to hear your answer. And that's, Sammy, what are you excited about in the near future? I told you that I had breakfast as cardio uh, in the morning and it's 3 p.m. and I still haven't eaten. So I've got a salad staring me down with a bit of chicken <laughs> and I'm getting a steak later on tonight, hopefully. So that's what I'm looking forward to, bro. I'm going to be doing my thing and, and yeah, just chilling out here. Very simple answer, simple life, but a beautiful yeah. answer. So Sammy, where can people find you? I want people to be able to connect with you. I know you're on a lot of different socials. Where should they go? Instagram, Twitter, TikTok, same handle, Sammy Loyal, S-A-M-I-L-O-Y-A-L underscore at the end. That's it. YouTube, Sammy Loyal, or you can type in four flies. On YouTube, I put out content on trading. I give extremely sober, rational, grounded analysis on the markets. It's quite uncomfortable to listen to a lot of the time because of how realistic it is. You know, the markets are not comfortable, so the analysis isn't either. And, you know, the, the Twitter, Instagram, you know, these are just fun. These are me, you know, expressing my thoughts and so on. What I want to direct people to more than me is to some fucking books. Go, go get your head in some books if you haven't already. Go read Think and Grow Rich. Go read some important stuff that all of the greats in the world these days have read. Forget about me. I, I, can't, I can't tell you things that these guys have told you better than them. So go get to the books. Don't worry about me. Obviously, links, I'm, I'm sure, are going to be in the description and stuff. So, yeah, that's good. Yeah. Everything will be down in the description, the description below. Make sure to go connect with Sammy. Tell him what's up. He's an amazing person who has so much more runway ahead of him. I mean, 22 years old. I'm really excited to stay connected with you and hopefully have you back on the pod a few times. I would love to talk to 30-year-old Sammy and see all of the amazing things that you've accomplished along this journey. I mean, again, I've said it a few times. Thank you so much for taking the time to come on the show, dude. I really appreciate it. And I, I'm, I'm just... I'm stoked to watch the rest of your journey unfold, dude. Congrats yeah, dude, on all of the successes. Thank you so much, man. And I want to see your podcast fucking top in charts when I'm 30. That's going to be enough time for you as well to get there. You won't, you won't need nearly that much time. And I'd love to come back anytime, mate. Hit me up. Yeah, man. Again, it was a pleasure, dude. And, and, and enjoy that steak tonight, man. Have a great yeah. rest of your day. Yeah, thank you, man. I will do. Back day today. Going to go get it. <laughs> all right, man. Cheers, mate. See ya.